Hello. I want to start today by saying what an absolute honor it is to have been asked to participate in this topic of human brain conversations. It's especially humbling to do this alongside a pioneering giant in our field, Ellen Bialystok. Thank you, Ellen, for your trailblazing research that created the entire research program on bilingualism and neurocognition as we know it today, and of course, for being my friend. Thank you to the Prada Foundation for creating this important series for the public. Situating research examining potential connections between exponents of bilingualism, cognition, and brain for such a diverse audience is a daunting task, but I'll give it my best shot. Without further ado then, my task today is first to contextualize what bilingualism is, inclusive of its many complexities on several fronts. Second, I will discuss how and why engaging with the naturally occurring ubiquitous mental activities needed for the juggling of more than one language can, on a spectrum, change our minds and indeed physical brain. Okay, if you're ready, let's get started. The things we choose to do in our daily lives have lasting effects beyond the moments in which they occur. Moreover, moments of choice have cumulative effects. Let's take, for example, the choice we make when we eat. Indulging every now and then aside, if we choose foods that are high in fat and calories all too often, there are potential immediate consequences. Our tummies might not appreciate it, for example, and cumulative effects reflected on our weight, our cholesterol levels, our heart health, and more. Of course, there are things we can do to counterbalance these choices. For example, physical exercise helps to compensate for the indulgent food choices we might make. As it turns out, Choices like conforming to healthier diet and good measure, consistent physical exercise over the lifespan have profound knock-on effects for our cognitive and brain health. We know this, but these are certainly not the only lifestyle choices that correlate to such effects. Many mundane activities we choose to engage in can have similar results, provided they entail considerable levels of cognitive exercising, such as achieving high levels of education, training and playing music at expert levels, even being an avid video game player. Research suggests that bilingualism can be added to this list of lifestyle experiences, adding to healthy cognitive life expectancy, the most important consequences of which Professor Bialystok discusses in her talk. If so, this is great news for many reasons. For now, I will highlight just one. Bilingualism stands out as something more equitable, more accessible in a global sense than most of the other known factors. Not everyone has the resources to achieve the highest levels of education, afford the healthiest of diets, or have the time needed for consistent exercise. Bilingualism, however, is literally everywhere, and in many cases, comes for free. So how does bilingualism do this? And what exactly is bilingualism? Let's have a deeper look. What does it mean to be bilingual? The answer is simultaneously simple and complex. In the most basic sense, a bilingual is a person who has knowledge for understanding and communicating in more than one language. Contrary to some popular beliefs, there is no true version of any given language. Thus, linguistic perfectionism, whatever that should mean anyway, brings little to bear as a bilingual qualifier criterion, although degree of fluency can have effects. With this simple definition in mind, Bilinguals come in all shapes and sizes, so to speak. What is important to acknowledge is that no two bilinguals are exactly the same. Underpinning this single word, bilingual, there is huge variability, including, but not limited to, the ages at which our languages were acquired, the relative abilities we have in our languages, our particular patterns for using them, and indeed the context or for what we use them for. Who do we or can we use our languages with? Are these groups small, large, diverse, etc.? How has our patterns of using our languages changed or remain the same over time? I could go on and on and on. The key issue to bear in mind is that differences like these are omnipresent, and as we will see later, may very well be deterministic for effects bilingualism can have on the mind and brain. This diversity is also what makes bilingualism such a complex yet interesting phenomenon to study. Bilingualism is an individual experience that is challenging 
to quantify. Depending on each viewer's personal context or where you join us from tonight, it might be more or less hard to believe that most of the world's population is bi, even multilingual. There are approximately 195 recognized countries in the world. At the same time, there are over 5,000 distinct languages spoken in our world. Clearly, the map does not add up for there to be a one country, one language mapping. And as we know, some countries share a majority language, such as the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, and Jamaica. And so the map tells us that there has to be significant language diversity and language contact in these 195 countries. As can be seen in the world map, this is definitively so. The greener or darker the color, the more languages are present. Where there's more diversity, bilingualism tends to be the default state. This indeed is the majority of the world. It's worth highlighting to my point about bilingualism as an equitable lifestyle factor that many of the most bilingual parts of the world coincide with economically disadvantaged areas. And what need not be from a place where there is huge linguistic diversity in the society to be bilingual? Take for example, Poland, which appears in light yellow on the diversity map. Looking at the chart on the right, one can see that roughly 62% of age working adults in Poland know and use a foreign language, just under the EU 28 average of 66%, or two in every three working age Europeans. Bilingualism is truly everywhere. I think it's worth mentioning that scientific research on bilingualism has witnessed a meteoric rise since the 1990s, very much especially so after 2004, when work by Ellen Bialy Stock and colleagues first indicated that bilingualism might have implications for a domain general cognition and the brain that is outside of effects for and on language itself. In fact, in 2005, in a special issue of the journal Science, Kennedy and Norman listed the quote, biological basis of second language learning or acquisition among the top 25 most important scientific questions to be answered in our times. Before getting deeper into the mind and the brain connections of bilingualism, it is worth mentioning what might be obvious, although not necessarily so. Bilingualism matters for a slew of domains, including, but not limited to, our family and social networks, inclusive of our abilities to be more able to communicate with exponentially more people than if we only have one language, general cross-cultural awareness. Bilingualism allows us to appreciate diversity, engage with other cultures, understand cultural differences, be more empathetic, and more. Food, wine, music, art, literature, and human experiences in general are perhaps appreciated more deeply in their native tongues. Academic, all other things controlled for and being equal, bilingual students often do better in general academic achievement. Economic, there is no escaping the globally connected environment in which we live. Bilingualism can have personal economic benefits, job competitiveness, for example. And as a necessary part of the global supply chain, bilingualism has many impacts at the societal level as well. Of particular relevance for today's discussion are potential ones for mind and brain, to which we will now turn. Now let's look at the neuroscience behind this. Let's think about what the brain has to do to accommodate the presence of two linguistic systems. Research shows that both languages remain constantly active in the brain, irrespective of contextual need, or conscious intent. Let's call this dual activation. Dual activation is necessary so that a bilingual can easily and instantly switch from one language to the other as required, which is frequently unpredictable. Perhaps an analogy will contextualize why this makes perfect sense. I join you today from above the Arctic Circle in Northern Norway. Here the temperatures are already frigid and there's a fresh layer of snow on the ground. As we know all too well, turning our car engine on and leaving it idling allows us to go on our way immediately as we need. If the engine is not already running for when we need it, it will take at least several minutes for the car to be drivable. In a similar way, bilingual brains keep all languages activated. This explains the apparent ease with which bilinguals are able to switch between their languages, even within the same conversation or sentence when appropriate and immediately as needed. Dual activation means that both languages are at a constant state of tug of war, vying for limited cognitive resources. Although there is a need for both languages to be kept active, doing so introduces competition in real time, 
requiring some serious mental juggling. The mental competition has to be managed or controlled so that the language being produced is appropriate for a given communicative context. Otherwise, we might produce a language the other person doesn't understand or a mix of all languages available to us. This need to control the two languages that are in competition brings us back to the heart of our question about the potential impact of bilingualism on neurocognition. It turns out that the mechanisms we use for bilingual language control are part of or overlap with a set of a wider cognitive control mechanism, which we call executive functions. We use executive functions whenever we shift our attention from one task to another, or when we need to ignore, for example, noises that are stopping us from concentrating on something else. We use these skills every day to learn, work, and manage daily life, to focus and even regulate our emotions. Bilingualism, at least under certain conditions, is argued to strain and thus train executive functions above and beyond their other engagements, leaving fingerprints on the mind and brain in its wake. This all embodies the very essence of the proposed general effects of bilingualism on neurocognition. In summary, inside a bilingual mind, there are two languages and they are kept active. Because the languages are both active, they compete. Because a bilingual has to contend with this competition, it makes heavy use of control mechanisms and executive functions. If this increased use of executive function means that executive functioning grows stronger, this will be felt beyond the language system. Researchers in the lab setting often administer to participants tasks that are believed to tap into executive functions. In other words, participants take experiments that are proxies for the everyday activities that require involvement of cognitive control mechanisms. All things being equal and ideally controlled, the simplest hypothesis is that bilinguals will do better than monolinguals on these experiments given more fine-tuned cognitive control. Early work in the field showed just that, but not for all bilinguals. The much cited Bialystok et al. 2005 study showed better bilingual performance in three age groups, most profoundly in younger and older ages, where cognition is either not fully developed or well past its prime peak. In other words, where cognitive tests often used in psychological research are most likely to pick up subtle differences. Similar effects in these groups have been replicated many times, as have the null results in younger adult populations. Obviously, child bilinguals pass through young adulthood before they become elderly. So what do we make of this? Work that looks beyond behavior, under the hood, so to speak, at the actual brain, shows that sometimes even when the behavioral performance on a specific task is no different between monolinguals and bilinguals at younger adult ages, the way the brain reacts to the task can be quite different and significantly so. In the picture on the right, you see that the monolingual brain requires much more energy to perform similarly as the bilingual brain does. Hold up. Explanation requires more than simple bilingual status. Not all bilingualism is the same, but it is often treated as if it were monolithic and then compared dichotomously to monolingualism, which itself is not monolithic. Acknowledging and dealing with this requires significant shifting in the way we approach and do our research. As depicted before you, there are many variables. Those on the left are examples. In other words, the list is not exhaustive that combine to condition outcomes on the right for bilingual grammars, sociolinguistic competencies, and mind-brain adaptations, which themselves share significant overlap. Effectively, the permutations of individual differences in proxies that relate to opportunities for linguistic engagement, opportunities that delimit the straining and thus training of cognitive control, more reasonably sit on a vast continuum of dynamic experiences across individuals. In other words, bilingualism is a spectrum, not an absolute state. In what follows, we will have a cursory look into some research from our labs that speak to how the dynamics of bilingualism play out. I'll give you the take home message already now. Bilingualism matters for cognitive and brain effects, but results are conditioned by individual engagement with the experiences that comprise one's very own bilingualism. In this study, our goal was to look at bilingual brain structure. We gave non-native speakers of English 
living in England, very detailed questionnaires about their experiences with bilingualism. For example, their age at which they acquired English, how they use each of their languages, quantity and context, in the home, with friends, at work, etc., on a daily basis, and much, much more. Keep in mind that all the participants are bilingual, but individuals varied significantly in their experiences that formed the basis of their very own bilingual profile. Recall, the idea was to see if there is a relationship between individual language experiences and brain structure. Yes, there most certainly is. I will note two important findings that can be gleaned from the images in front of you. First, individual bilingual experience along a continuum affects brain structure differentially. And crucially, changes are not random. Rather, they are seen in exactly those areas used to regulate the languages bilingual have, where language and cognitive control overlap. In another study, we examined bilingualism effects on brain function as opposed to structure. Using the same participants from the previous study, we looked at their brains while performing a simple task that measures aspects of cognitive control. As can be seen in the graph, the task worked. We see the expected effects across the groups. That is, at points in the task, when it is more demanding, people are slower. This is true regardless of individual differences of bilingual experience. In other words, Bilingual experience did not predict individual behavioral performance. Perhaps this is so because everyone was so darn good, making it difficult to tease anything apart. But is everyone's brain the same when arriving at these indistinguishable behavioral performances? No. Individual differences in bilingual experience correlated to how the brain reacted to doing the tasks. For example, the longer one had experience using English, the less brain resources were required for optimal task performance, indicating better management of energy and thus increased brain efficiency. It has been my pleasure to walk you through the basics of how bilingualism can be viewed as a lifestyle factor affecting the mind and brain. I look forward to our live conversation on November 25th. Until then, let me leave you with some thoughts in summary. Regardless of where one is from, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, etc. We all use languages and bilingualism surrounds us. Bilingualism can train the mind and brain, but individual differences in bilingual language experience predict or correlate to brain adaptation. Bilingualism can lead to health, economic, and social benefits, but much more work, much more integrated work across many disciplines is needed to understand this fully. Again, I want to thank you for your time and attention, as well as all the many people behind this production today, including all the wonderful people at the Prada Foundation. Of course, the work I get to discuss is a reflection of a huge team of researchers in my lab, the Psycholinguistics of Language Representation Lab at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and my many talented colleagues in the Aquarora Research Center and the Department of Languages and Culture more broadly in Tromsø, and the Nebrija Center of Cognition at the University Nebrija, Madrid, Spain. Thank you also to the funders of our research and all of you.